So, one more speech right before the coffee break. Let's welcome Adrian Mannock, Minock, right? Minock, from Smart Beer, and he will talk about the benefits of API contract testing once he's ready with his Microsoft computer. <laughs> I should be good now. Yeah. Okay. Stage is yours. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Adrian from Smarter, and what I'm going to go through today is just the benefits of contract testing, basically what contract testing is, how it can be implemented, and then the, the benefits, some of the challenges with it, and how they can be approached. So I know a lot of, from the talks that we had earlier on today downstairs, there is a lot of interest at the moment in contract testing. So let's say to anybody that's not aware, um, with contract testing, contract testing is basically a flavor of the design first approach to API development, where you're going to be um, designing your API using a definition. And then from there, you're going to be building the code from that design. So with contract testing, the definition is going to work as the contract. So you'll be able to, let's say, you might build out the, con or the definition itself, and then the requirements between the provider and the consumer will be uh, established at that stage. So with regards to what we're looking at here, with contract testing, it's basically the practice of writing the tests, which will ensure that both the provider and the consumer will be able to fulfill their requirements. So with this, what we're looking at on the right hand side here is just, uh, it's basically the, the industry standard at the moment for REST APIs. So it's the open API specification. And this would be one of the, as I, as I mentioned, this would be the industry standard at the moment for let's say the contract testing. So the parties involved with the contract testing, I mentioned it just briefly there, but we have both the provider and the consumer. So there's two approaches that can be taken to this. So first of all, we have, let's say, the provider-driven approach. Sorry, now. Oh. Ah, come back. Okay, hopefully it says that. <laughs> I seen this there about an hour ago of one of the talks. Good. Cursed by always the same on conference. Ah, perfect. Fingers crossed. Man. Don't touch it. Yeah, <laughs> stand, stand on the <laughs> Okay, perfect. So, yeah, as I mentioned, there's two two main ways that let's say the contract driven testing, two main approaches. So we have the both the provider and the consumer. So, with regards to this, we have let's say a provider driven approach where we have, let's say, the provider defining the contract. So let's say defining the, the functionality that's going to be involved in the API. And then from there, it's going to be up to the consumer to make sure that the functionality is sufficient. So there's going to be that feedback loop between both the designer, or sorry, the provider and the consumer. And it's up to 
the consumer to actually make sure that the functionality that's in the design is sufficient or in the contract is sufficient. And then from there, it's the onus is going to be on the consumer so that let's say they'll be able to interface and interact with the um, with the contract and with the API. So with regards to the consumer driven approach. With the consumer driven approach, this will allow the consumer to define the expectations or the requirements within the definition itself. So from here, let's say the consumer can define, okay, we, we're looking for these methods, these endpoints, and it's up then to the provider that, let's say, the consumer can expose this contract to the provider, and it's then up to the, contra or the provider to, let's say, meet the customer's needs. So once again, there is, let's say, benefits to both with regards to the consumer-driven approach. The fact that they're the ones defining the requirements means that, let's say, there is no, let's say, there might be any additional functionality that the provider might implement that might actually be needed. Okay, so within this slide, I just want to take a, a look at, let's say, a workflow, a typical workflow for, let's say, contract testing and a design first approach. So we can see on the right hand side here, we have a diagram. Now, let's say, with a code first approach, <coughs> when it be, let's say, at the very top, we'd have a high level plan. And then from there, let's say, with the high level plan, we build out the, the requirements, let's say, who's going to be consuming this, um, what needs to be involved in it. So from there, we're just going to start coding. So the code's going to be written. With the design first approach and contract testing, we can see after we have our high level plan, we then go into the design phase. So we have the feedback between both the consumer and the provider. We're gathering, let's say, and establishing solid requirements. And then from there, I mean, for regards, let's say, the building and the testing, they should be aligned, they, both of those should be aligned with the contract. So with regards to say making any changes, being able to establish the requirements at an earlier stage, let's say in that feedback loop, means that you can implement any changes at an earlier stage and you're not having to, let's say it minimizes the, the cost of it, so you're not having to do this once the code is developed. You can just implement the change into the design and then that can be implemented during the development. So as we were saying, we get earlier feedback with this method and it's easier to make the changes to the API. Now, with regards to say contract testing and from talking to a number of people this morning, we can see there, there are a number of challenges from here. So let's say with contract testing, one of the main issues is, let's say, the implementation. So the implementation for contract testing is a lot slower. Obviously, you're not just jumping in, first of all, and let's say designing the code or starting writing the code. You have continuous feedback loops and have, let's say, you might have one designer working on the actual contract and then a number of technical people reviewing that. Then once again, reviewing or exposing to the consumer or vice versa. So there's a lot of work needed, but once again, it will, let's say, improve the, the requirements. But uh, let's say from a developer point of view, it does slow down the, the development of the code. Now the second <coughs> point here is the, the cost of migrating to a design first approach. So. And let's say this would link in with the, the last point as well. But let's say if somebody is currently using a code first approach, one of the main issues is okay, how do we move over? Let's say we might need to change our tool sets, we might need to change, let's say, the approach that let's say the developers are taking. Um, you know, obviously, most developers will want to just start coding straight away. Um, 
there's a number of different factors that say costs associated with this. Um, and then with regards to legacy APIs, if you do, let's say, if you are currently using a code first approach, and then you want to, let's say, migrate then to a legacy, or like you want to migrate to a design first or a contract testing approach, you might have existing APIs that don't have any documentation. Obviously, you want to keep these aligned. So with that, there's going to be a certain cost of, let's say, putting in the effort to create the documentation from your existing APIs. So let's say normally this can be done in a couple of ways using open source tools. Let's say clients where you can send requests, receive the responses, and then generate the documentation from that. Or you can use, let's say, annotations to layer on top of your code. And then from there, you can generate um, the documentation. But once again, with, those, with both approaches, it's going to be a case where there is a certain level of effort involved. And once again, it's just drawbacks to it. But once they are, let's say, once you have those legacy APIs documented, it's done. And you can update that in, let's say, whatever tool you're using for documentation. So with regards to benefits, there's a number of benefits to contract testing and a design first approach. So let's say one of the main things, obviously I want to throw in a picture of Paris, but um, obviously it's creating solid foundations. So once you clearly have, let's say, a contract defined, all the requirements are known, let's say, between the, the consumer and the provider, then you know, okay, right, this is solid. The code should be developed and it should be in line with this. And also all the testing should be in line with that as well. So that's your single source of truth. You know everything should align with the contract. So also the second point there, identify changes. So this is something I mentioned earlier. Being able to identify any changes within your, um, let's say, the design is a lot easier than, let's say, finding out changes in that needs to be done through testing and having to implement those changes into your development. So being able to easily identify, collaborate, and make those changes at an earlier stage um, makes a huge, huge difference. So, Moving on there, uh, the third point where regards, let's say, create the solid foundations will be, it allows for the removal of unnecessary and redundant functionality. So this is something that, let's say, I would have spoken, let's say, briefly on where regards, with the consumer-driven approach. If the consumer is defining the contract and they're sure that, okay, everything we have here is the functionality that we need, then the provider can use that and okay, they know, okay, right, this is fully what the consumer wants. With the, let's say, if the provider is defining the approach first and implementing the API, there could be functionality there that might be redundant that the customer might not need. So at least with the contract-driven approach, it allows for the removal of, let's say, the unnecessary or redundant functionality from the design or from the contract. So next, the last benefit, or one of the main benefits, is with regards to efficient testing. So as I mentioned, having the, let's say, clear set of requirements in the contract allows for a clear set of testing requirements. So once we have those, we know, okay, right, the testing team will be aligned with the contract, that's the single source of truth, and that's known. But from there then, we can reduce the manual processes in the testing as well. So if you're using a design first approach, you will have, let's say, your <coughs> definition. So as we mentioned earlier, if you're using the open API definition, you would have, you'd be able to generate, let's say, a JSON or YAML format. So once you have the JSON or the YAML formats generated, 
from there, you'd be able to, there'd be tools for you could, let's say, import your definition. It can auto-generate your functional tests, and from there you can begin your testing. So, not only is it, let's say, just defining clear requirements, but you're also, let's say, reducing the manual processes with regards, let's say, testing, having to create all of your functional API tests manually. And then the last point there is reducing dependency on your development. So reducing the dependency on your development with, let's say, contract testing means that you can use API virtualization. So rather than, let's say, having to wait for all of your development to be done in order to begin your testing, we can consume our API <coughs> definition, so as we mentioned, in either JSON or YAML format, and we can consume that. Once again, there's tools where you can virtualize this. Once you have the virtual API, you could, you could let's say, add in logic to ensure that it's going to be acting in the same way that the live or the existing API is to work. And then from there, you can run all of your functional tests against that. So it means that basically your development and your testing can run in parallel, so it cuts down on that time difference. So I'd say they're the main um, areas that I wanted to touch on with regards, let's say, creating and establishing solid requirements, and then from there being able to, let's say, more test your APIs more efficiently. So from there, that's, let's say, the, the main focus of it, it's just a high level run through of, let's say, API testing, or sorry, contract testing for your APIs, and then being able to, let's say, establish your requirements, virtualize your APIs, and then run your functional tests against those. So, time-wise, you know, I'm conscious, probably finished a bit early, but, um, I just wanted to check, is there any questions with regards to the contract te testing or anything? Any questions? One question. Come on, thank you. I don't mean to mic. Yeah, just take it. Yeah, no problem, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, thanks for the presentation. Uh, one small comment first. Uh, that's all benefits and uh, what you mentioned here. At least it sounds like not benefits for contract testing, but contract based development. So, but potentially contract testing is a part of contract based development. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, then, question is. Uh, so the whole presentation was called uh, contract testing benefit, something like this. I don't remember exactly. So if we will try to remove all benefits from the contract the, the contract uh, driven development, so what the, the benefit about the testing itself? So yeah, definitely we can, um, uh, based on this contract, we can uh, create mocks and use these mocks for testing and for starting development of applications that's consuming this API. But from the testing perspective, so can you summarize once again what will be the, the benefit for the QA engineer, for example, for this? Yeah, so I suppose for the QA engineer, the main benefits will be, let's say, with the contract, and with contract development, I know you mentioned there, but you would have everything established. But from there, for the QA engineer, if you're using that approach, which will be design first approach, the, the automation of the tests will be, let's say, one of the key things. So being able to consume the contract and then from there auto-generate and virtualize the, um, the API. So being able to test that in an earlier stage, but then also having a clear set of requirements. So rather than if you're manually building out, so if you're a QA engineer and you're manually building out each of your tests, there's potential that, let's say, some of the tests might be let's say be included, whereas if you're consuming your contract, you know everything that's in the contract, which is your single source of truth, is included in your functional test. 
So everything that you're going to be running is included as part of that. So you know your, your tests are, that are, let's say, defined or consumed and generated are coming from a single source of truth. And not manually, let's say, there's less risk of something being missed, let's say, for the testing. Okay, thank you, Edwin. Perfect. Thank you. So